You too, what it do, what it do, it's your boy No Code. Today we got another video uh, by the Fat Electrician. Y'all told me I was gonna get stuck in the loop um, and I'm loving it. I'm, I'm not even trying to get out of it, to be honest. Allison in Wonderland, me, you know what I'm saying? Uh, his videos are fire, his storytelling, A1. Um, I, I don't have anything bad to say about bro. And he's educating himself to be a history teacher, which if you've seen my very first video, you see that I said the exact same thing. Like, dude would have been my history teacher. That would not have just been my sleeping period. I'm not gonna lie to you. So without further ado, I don't wanna waste no more time. Let's get into the video. The Fat Electrician, American dismantles pirate nations for touching their boats. The Barbarian Wars. Let's get to it. Ah yes, that time that pirates kept messing with American ships. So George Washington founded the United States Navy to do something about it. Yeah, the United States Navy was founded for the sole reason of hunting pirates. <laughs> Today we're talking about the Barbary Wars. Ladies and gentlemen, it is pretty much an ongoing internet joke that you do not mess that with America's boats. Is hard. You know, because of Side Operation note. Praying Mantis, that time that America decided they were gonna sink half of Iran's Navy in like eight hours. And and Vietnam and and World War Two and World War One right. and the Spanish American War. They were definitely War, going crazy at that time period. Um, I guess if you're not picking up what I'm putting down, I'm trying to tell you this is the origin story of why you don't mess with America's boats. But first, a word from our sponsor because this video is brought to you by my favorite underwear company, Sheath. Wait, hold on. I'm supposed to read a script for this one. Here's how to do a perfect ad read for our company. Let's take a quick second <laughs> to thank our favorite sponsor for today's show, which is Sheath Underwear. Sheath makes the most comfortable boxer briefs ever worn. And Clarence's parents have a real good marriage. This shit's fucking weird. Okay, look, here's the deal. Whether you're talking to a veteran, a construction if y'all don't know where that line is from you gotta see the eight mile oh, <laughs> w movie i love me some eminem construction worker your dad they're all going to tell you that there's one universal truth to life and that truth is that cargo pockets are fucking awesome god damn right. i can't get that if you think that cargo shorts in my head cool, wait till you try cargo underwear except the cargo pocket is made with balls not being stuck to your thigh technology and i know Yo, what you're thinking i have to get me a pair <laughs> I, I hate that feeling all like fellas it. out there cool. you Just understand wear them like normal underwear and then you have a bonus cargo pocket nobody in the history of mankind has ever been like damn it i have too many available cargo pockets it's never happened <laughs> First of all, cargo shorts are awesome. They always have been. Second of all, you know what you and this cargo pocket have in common? You don't feel either of us? Well, at least I know who I'm not letting put their phone in my pocket Dang. next time we go somewhere. Anyways, if you wanted to try some sheath cargo underwear for yourself she or just buy some him. as a gift for your significant other, I'll have them linked in the description down below. And you can use the discount code FATELECTRICIAN for 20% off. Back to the video. All right, here's the deal. For three centuries, pirates from the Barbary states of Morocco, Algiers, Tunis, and Tripoli would raid merchant vessels in the Mediterranean, steal all the goods, and imprison and turn all of the crew members into slaves. So why was this allowed to go on for over 300 years? Well, the only navies powerful enough to stop these pirates at the time were the Spanish, the French, and the British. And they all came to the same conclusion that it would be cheaper to pay off the pirates, giving them a yearly tribute to not raid their ships rather than go to war with them. So now those those three empires aren't getting their ships raided, which is fine. That's, that's, that's a good dope. thing, I guess. But here's the catch with it that they it's may or may catch. not have known at the time, but they definitely figured out somewhere along the way. Now the pirates are only raiding all the smaller nations. Okay, it's like Walmart, Target, and Amazon getting together, encouraging shoplifting, knowing that they can shoulder the financial burden, but it puts all the other mom and pop stores out of business and they become the only ones selling goods. Except instead of retail stores, we're talking about entire nations. This goes on Dang. for literally hundreds of years, but America is still part of the British Empire, so they fall under their umbrella of protection, so it's never an issue. That is until the American Revolution started on April 19th, 1775, with the shot heard around the world, the Battle of Lexington and Concord, and the famous famous story of a 78 year old veteran going out into his front yard and shooting three redcoats as they retreated back to Boston, sending the message for all of America that the British Empire should get off that, of our lawn. That, that Fast forward to 1783, aim. America wins the Revolutionary War, officially becoming its own country, and all of America's merchant vessels start flying the old red, white, and blue. And pretty much immediately, 1784, America. one of America's merchant vessels is captured by Barbary pirates from the country of Morocco. As an act of good faith for a new nation, Spain actually pays off the pirates gets the American vessel and all of its crew back, returns it to America, and then advises the American government, hey, 
you guys should start paying these guys off too. That's what all the big nations are doing. At which point America's minister to France, a guy by the name of Thomas Jefferson chimes in and he's like, no, absolutely not. I'm gonna go talk to him. Now, obviously I'm paraphrasing here, but basically Thomas Jefferson rolls up and he's like, hey, don't ever fuck with my boats ever again or else. At which point the Sultan of Morocco is like, I'm sorry, who are you? I'm Thomas Jefferson, one of the founding fathers of America. You know, we just kicked the British out of our entire country. We're our own thing now. I'm sorry, you fucking pilgrims did what now? We beat the British in war and now we are our own country. You mean to tell me that a bunch of colonial farmers with muskets went toe to toe with the largest military on the planet that is so good at war that they can literally wear high vis red coats the entire time and still win and you beat them. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm telling you. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I could probably just leave your boats alone from now on. That Facts. historically seems like it's going to be a really good idea. And that is the story of how Morocco came to be the first country to recognize America as its own sovereign nation by signing the Moroccan-American Treaty of Peace and Friendship, which is the first and longest lasting peace treaty in American history. At which point Thomas Jefferson is like, wow, that actually worked out perfect. I'm going to go to the other three Barbary states and tell them the same thing now. I just realized that I completely said that word wrong. I think I might have said barbarian. I, I don't even know. Embarrassing. I know how to read. I'm educated. You know how sometimes you look at a word and you're just like, that's what it is. And your brain is just already fixated that that's what it is. So let's say it. That's probably what happened. But of course, there's going to be a catch with that. You see, there's four Barbary states, but Morocco is the only one that's actually truly independent. And the other three are just subservient branches of the Ottoman Empire. So Thomas Jefferson and John Adams go to talk to the ambassador of Tripoli and they're like, hey, can all the Ottoman Barbary Chipotle. states leave our boats alone? Oh, At which point the ambassador informs them, absolutely not. You see, we're part of the Ottoman Empire. We don't need to listen to you. We're not scared of you guys. And it is our official stance that, and I quote, it was written in the Quran that all nations which had not acknowledged the prophet were sinners who it was the right and duty of the faithful to plunder and enslave. You know, unless they give us money, of course. Everything's Thanks. got a price, apparently. So Thomas Jefferson is like, well, okay, we're going to war then. And that's when John Adams is like, whoa, 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 calm down. Let's just pay the tribute so that our ships can be fine. We already disbanded the Continental Navy after winning the Revolutionary War. We don't have a Navy to fight these guys. We just have to give them the money. So that's what happened. For the next eight to 10 years, America would pay tribute every year to these three remaining Barbary states. And every year they wanted more and more money. And eventually even that wasn't enough because Algiers began attacking American vessels anyways. Okay, if you're not picking up what I'm putting down, I'm trying to tell you that for the first time in American history, somebody has fucked with one of America's boats and they're not immediately sorry about it yet the president at the time george washington say, no goes way. to congress and pretty much tells them what's going to happen because at this point in time george washington is basically the king of america nobody actually knows if he's going to step down from presidency or not so he's like hey guess what you guys are going to pass the naval act of 1794 establishing the united states navy and at the very top of that document it very clearly states that the purpose we are building the United States Navy is so that we can combat Algerine Corsairs, which is just a fancy word for state-funded pirates. Yes, mm. I'm telling you that the founding document of the mm. most powerful navy the world has ever seen at the top specifically Some pirate states, Caribbean the type sole vibe. reason for their creation is to hunt down and destroy pirates that had the audacity to fuck with one of America's ships. We've right. officially entered the find out portion of the story. America immediately commissions the building of six enormous frigates covered in guns to go fight these pirates fast forward to when the frigates are done it takes a couple years it is now 1798 and george washington has decided to step down from power allowing for an election to happen and we are now into the second president of america john adams and john adams decides he would rather keep paying tribute disappointed America just created the Navy, spent a million dollars creating all these frigates, and now John Adams isn't going to use them for their intended purpose. Obviously, a lot of people are upset, including his own vice president, Thomas Jefferson. So Thomas Dang. Jefferson, the vice president at the time, immediately begins campaigning to run against the sitting president in the next election. And one of his biggest platforms is that he is going to go fight these pirates rather than pay them tribute. And his slogan for this is, and I quote, millions in defense before a cent in tribute. Okay, just so we're wow. clear, Thomas Jefferson's platform for running for president is I'm going to spend millions of dollars in defense, which might as well be hundreds of billions of dollars at that point, because America no longer negotiates with terrorists. And I'm pretty sure my high school would English we? teacher would refer to this as 
foreshadowing. So Thomas Jefferson wins the election, the entire world finds out that he's gonna be the third president of the United States of America, and then on March 4th, 1801, the day of his inauguration, he receives a letter from Yusuf Karmanali, the Pasha of Tripoli. If you don't know, Pasha is like the dictator, the king, the president, the, the main dude in charge. And at this point, Thomas Jefferson, Learn the guy who just day. ran an entire presidential campaign on, I'm gonna go fight pirates, is thinking in his head like, maybe, this guy found out that I'm about to send a Navy over there to beat him up, and he's going to send an apology. Maybe he <laughs> he's like, hey, chill, like chill, 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 chill. This we, is we, already we, we working out great. I might not even have to send my Navy over there. Thanks. He opens the letter, and Pasha Yusuf Karmanali has decided that he is going to poke the Pilgrim King because he is now demanding that because of the new administration, the United States owes him an extra $225,000 in tribute. And Thomas Jefferson is pissed. You're trying to get crazy with us. Don't you know I'm local? Originally, Thomas Jefferson was going to have to go to Congress, no get permission to activate the Navy, to send them over there to fight these pirates, but not now. He's so mad, we're activating the rainbow shortcut to ass whooping land, and Pasha <laughs> Yusuf is going to have some consequences immediately because he's sending the Navy today. But like I said, it takes a literal act of Congress to send the U.S. Navy over there on a military mission, so Thomas Jefferson is like, that's fine, we just won't send them on a military mission. Fill up one of our frigates with a bunch of gifts and peace offerings for Pasha Yusuf, and then give it a nice, healthy escort of other frigates to defend it and send them on their merry way to deliver the gifts. Right after he gives the commander of the United States Navy the standing order that he is also to defend any American citizen or ship from any potential aggression. Not aggression, potential aggression. If he right. thinks that somebody else might be thinking about exactly. doing something aggressive. We're finna handle that. I'll take him down. Do We're finna handle that. Easy money. So the Navy set sail. They're gone. They're Get it done. Route. Thomas Jefferson sent his office say, and just comes do it. The Mazda CX-90 comes standard with a turbo inline six and all-wheel drive. All that responsiveness, that comes standard too. This car is nice Volvo. The three-row Mazda CX-90. Realization, man. I'm pretty sure these pirates are going to attack them, but if they don't, they're actually going to end up giving Pasha what's his nuts a bunch of these gifts. And I can't have it. So right. he whips out the old quill and parchment. He writes a letter back and sends that off. And that letter basically reads, hey, America's done giving you tribute for the rest of forever. Right. F off. And obviously the letter makes it there first, at which point Pasha goes to the American consulate building and chops down the flagpole with the American flag on it which in that part of the world is how you declare war. So the U.S. Navy shows up off the coast of the Barbary States. The pirates attack them because they've already declared war. The U.S. Navy defends themselves. Word gets back to America. Congress then is like, oh, hey, we're at war. We're going to go ahead and give Thomas Jefferson permission to use the United States Marine Corps at his discretion. And this is why, to this day, the United States Marine Corps is the only branch of the U.S. military that can be sent and deployed anywhere in the world without congressional approval. So for the next two years, the U.S. Navy and the Marine Corps set up a naval blockade and just go on a pirate hunting extravaganza until October wow. of 1803, when the USS Philadelphia would get hung up on an uncharted reef right off the coast of Tripoli. The pirates seize this opportunity. They attack the USS Philadelphia, board it, take the crew hostage, and then over the next couple months, they were able to repair it enough to get it back into the harbor at Tripoli, where they then anchored it in place and used it as fixed artillery because it had way more guns than any other vessel they had. Cue our first main character, Stephen Decatur, the commander of the USS Enterprise, America's unofficial flagship. He decides that he's going to don his plot armor, take the USS Enterprise out, and acquire himself a pirate ship, which he does. He then takes that pirate ship and the USS Enterprise and sails both of them to Sicily, where he hires five Sicilian mercenaries that know how to speak Arabic. They then sail back to Tripoli, where Decatur and 80 Marines are going to go below deck of this pirate ship, which has now been christened the USS Intrepid, as the five mercenaries are going to sail directly into the heart of the harbor, pretending to be Barbary pirates. They then go directly to the USS Philadelphia. 80 Marines and Stephen Decatur run out, kill the entire crew of pirates that are on the USS Philadelphia, and reclaim it. Unfortunately, the USS Philadelphia is too damaged to actually be used as a ship ever again, at which point Stephen Decatur decides, fine, 
we're just going to burn the entire thing to the ground because if we can't have it, nobody can. Uh, Deprive oh. the enemy of nice things. I'm pretty sure Sun Tzu said that. So that's exactly what they do. <laughs> they light the USS Philadelphia on fire. They're positive it can't be put out. And then they bounce. Not a single American is injured. And Stephen Decatur is hailed a hero because Dang. he has now led what is, in my opinion, America's first special operations mission. So now that that's taken care of, the problem at hand is that the crew of the USS Philadelphia is still being held hostage by the Barbary pirates, and they want a ton of money in exchange for them back. However, America no longer negotiates yeah, with terrorists, and that's not an option. Cue our next two main They're characters, take it. William Eaton and Presley O'Bannon. And before you ask, yes, go Presley straight, O'Bannon, William. as in the USS O'Bannon, the Fletcher-class destroyer from World War II that sank a Japanese submarine with potatoes. So they go in and they pitch their idea of how they're going to get the crew of the USS Philadelphia wow. back. And it the creativity is, by every definition, ships is, a special operation. Right Basically, there. Basically, they want to take themselves two dudes plus six Marines for a total of eight guys. And they're going to get dropped off in Egypt because in Egypt is Yusuf Karmali's brother that is living in exile because Yusuf kicked him out because he is technically the rightful heir of Tripoli. So they're going to get that guy and all the buddies that are loyal to him, like 500 men, and then they're going to march them through the desert to Derna, where they are then going to use them to fight and take over the city and exchange the city for the crew of the USS Philadelphia. And upon hearing this ridiculous plan, the U.S. military leadership is like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You want to take a small contingency of men, be dropped off in a foreign country, meet up with a rebel leader who already has a bunch of men, and then convince him that you're going to help him overthrow a current dictator, and then he can be the new dictator, and basically we're using other people to fight other people that we don't like to benefit us. And Presley O'Bannon and Eaton are like, yeah, that's, that's pretty much exactly it. And the government is like, this is a terrific idea. I mean, we're probably never, ever going to do anything like this ever again. <laughs> we're not going to have an entire branch of special forces that specializes in it. Sorry. Anyways, that's exactly what they do. They get dropped off in Egypt. They track down Hamet. They're like, hey, you want to go overthrow your brother? Cool. Grab your guys. Let's go. Somewhere along the way, the Marines also picked up 50 Greek Can't even trust family. they all began marching 500 miles through the Libyan desert to get back to the Tripolitan coast. And this march through the desert takes 50 days, and it is a complete shit show because somewhere along the way, they start running low on supplies and they have to start rationing and then some people get mad there's accusations because the greek guys are christian hamet's guys are muslims there's fighting amongst themselves and there's these eight marines standing in the middle desperately trying to keep them from killing each other as they march through the desert so despite multiple mutiny attempts and a ton of fights the marines were able to keep this group together enough to make it through the Libyan desert till they arrived at the coastal city of Bomba. Once they get there, they meet up with the USS Argus that gives them a bunch of supplies so they can start eating food again, and they give enough money to pay off the Greek mercenaries. Then, Eaton decides that he's going to send a letter over to the governor of Derna right next door, because remember, we can't attack unless they're potentially aggressive. Okay, so he sends a letter and is basically like, hey... I'm going to march my army through the middle of your town to go kill your boss on my way to Tripoli. Um, can I have some safe passage and maybe some food? The governor of Derna sends a letter back that says, my head or yours, which sounds potentially aggressive enough. So they begin making the plan for the ground attack. Hamet and his men are going to take the governor's palace, and the marines and the Greek mercenaries are going to take out the harbor fortress. But to do that, they're going to need a cannon from the USS Argus, so they're going to meet up with it, go get this cannon, and prepare for their attack. Cut back to Stephen Decatur. While all this has been happening, there's still been a naval battle in the Mediterranean the entire time, and Stephen Decatur is on an absolute rampage, because after he captured his first pirate ship, he would receive word that his brother, James Decatur, had been mortally wounded by one of the pirate ship's captains, who was pretending to surrender before shooting his younger brother. Upon hearing mm. this, Decatur immediately gives command of the new captured vessel to one of his men, leaves a couple guys with- uh, He pulled a, uh, okay, okay. <laughs> him and takes off to track oh, your own brother ship that just killed his brother so they chase down this pirate ship they pull up right next to it and before the crew has time to do any boarding procedures you know like break out the planks tie some ropes to the other ship all that stuff you see in the movies nah Stephen Decatur jumps into the enemy ship and starts killing pirates immediately. Nine Marines, seeing that happen, are like, oh shit, we're doing this. So they jump onto the pirate ship too and start throwing down, at which point... Who be painting these pictures? Are these like... Somebody's just standing there like, oh, this is this is amazing. Like, let me just... Wait, wait, wait. Can y'all stay like right there? Or did somebody take a picture and then they made it into a painting? Like, which... Nah, they couldn't have taken a picture. Did they have cameras back then? I'm not sure. 
the pirate ship veers off and breaks away from Decatur's ship. It is now nine Marines and Stephen Decatur versus over 30 pirates on this vessel, and 30 is not going to be enough. Stephen Decatur kills multiple pirates, including the captain that had slain his brother, officially avenging his brother's death capturing that vessel as well but he is still absolutely furious that his brother died and he continues to go on a rampage capturing another pirate ship and destroying three more over the coming weeks cut back to the men on the ground eaton and o'bannon have been getting their battle plan ready this entire time they just had their men go get a cannon off the uss argus because they really really need this cannon if they're going to be able to pull off this mission so Thanks. they're ready to attack the u.s navy gets into formation and they are going to bombard the entire city of derna while they launch this attack despite that there's over 2,000 men loyal to Pasha Yusuf that are going to defend it, and they are heavily outnumbered. So Navy starts bombarding the shore. Hamet and his men take off to go attack the governor's palace, and Eaton, O'Bannon, the Marines, and the Greek mercenaries begin launching their attack on the harbor fortress. They open up with the initial cannon fire, which is going to be vital to be able to break through the enemy lines and establish their foothold. They fire the cannon. As they go to reload and fire it again, they realize that they had accidentally forgot to take the ramrod out of the cannon and shot that at the enemy too now the cannon's completely out and they're kind of like oh shit what do we do what do we do and presley o'bannon just charges into battle as the other marines follow behind him and the greek mercenaries behind them they attack so quickly and so violently that they're able to overrun the entire enemy fortress before anybody really knows what's going on and presley o'bannon becomes the first american ever to raise the star-spangled banner over a foreign battlefield this battle the taking of the tripolitan coastal city of derna is enshrined like in marine yeah. corps history in the marine corps hymn <clears throat> with the line from the halls of montezuma to the shores of Tripoli and it is also where the Marine Corps would get their first nickname ever because the seven Marines present for this battle fought so hard and so violently that they simply became known as the Leathernecks referring to the leather collar that they wore around their neck to protect it from slashes from pirate swords so Yusuf's men are getting beaten back and are forced to retreat to Tripoli at which point the Marines the Greeks and Hamet side note imagine that being like a sports team name the Leathernecks like his men all consolidate figure out what happened they try to use everything as a sport team take over the governor's palace and after the taking of the city of derna hamet awards his very own sword to presley o'bannon as a gift for how valiantly he fought in battle and this is the mameluke sword the same sword that is on the marine corps uniform today so now yusuf That's consolidates fire. his military sends an enormous army back to derna to try to take it back over and they're kind of just sitting on the outskirts of the city waiting for the right moment to attack eaton and o'bannon are writing correspondence to the u.s military in the chain of command like hey we took this entire city with like eight marines give us some reinforcements we're gonna go take tripoli next and then we'll just overthrow this entire country this goes on for over a month and they defend the city multiple times from attacks from yusuf's men and eventually eaton receives a letter informing him that he is to stand down and just leave because American diplomat Tobias Locke has struck up a deal with Yusuf Carmanali. And apparently he struck up this deal with absolutely nobody's permission because the deal is America is gonna pay Yusuf Carmanali, the pirate king, $60,000. And in exchange, we are gonna receive the USS Philadelphia back as well as a peace treaty that they are gonna leave American ships alone from now on. So yeah, everybody's pretty pissed off about it from Thomas Jefferson, Presley O'Bannon, William Eaton, Stephen Decatur. We don't want to give you nothing. Just sign the peace treaty. This pirate king, as opposed to overthrowing his entire city of Tripoli, or at a minimum using the fact that they're holding Derna and use that as leverage to exchange. But whatever, the war's over, I guess for now so the peace treaties were signed in 1805 now fast forward seven years 1812 the war of 1812 happens okay if you don't know the war of 1812 there's more to it than this but the reason that it started is that great britain wanted to have more control over the seas and trade because america was getting too much because america was no longer getting attacked by pirates because we just beat them in a war now too so Great Britain launches another war against America. During this war, they encourage the Barbary pirates to start attacking American vessels again. And honestly, it works out pretty good for the pirates, at least for a little while, because the American Navy is too busy to worry about them because their hands are full with the British Navy. Fast forward two years, eight months later, the War of 1812 ends. Now, luckily for the Barbary pirates, Thomas Jefferson is no longer president at this point. We are on to America's fourth president. Let me check my notes here. Um. James Madison. If you don't know, James <laughs> Madison is one half of what is referred to as the forefathers dynamic duo. And the other half is his best friend of all time, 
Thomas Jefferson. And I don't know if you figured this out yet at this point in the story, but Thomas Jefferson hates pirates. So sitting president James Madison being the homie that he is Clearly. looks over at now Commodore Stephen Decatur and says, go get him tiger. He then proceeds to assemble the largest U.S. naval fleet ever at this point in time and sails directly to the Barbary Coast. He then immediately tracks down Algiers flagship, the Mashuda, takes it out, captures over 400 members of its crew and the ship itself. He then proceeds to take all of his gunboats directly to Algiers, park them in the port and say, here's the deal. You're going to surrender and you're never going to collect tribute from anyone ever again, or I'm going to overthrow your entire country. Obviously they take the first option, at which point Decatur's like, okay, cool. Next order of business. You're also going to pay me back for all the U.S. merchandise that you plundered during the war of 1812. And they're yeah. like, okay, here you go. They give it to him. He then proceeds to sail his fleet next door to Tunis and tell them the exact same thing ordering them to sign a peace treaty, never raid an American vessel again, and then collects a bunch of money. He then sails them next door again to Tripoli and does the exact same thing, collects all this money, Good collection the notice. treaties, the Barbary pirates never mess with America ever again. Decatur and his fleet sail back home and he tells the government what happened. The American government is blown away at the results that Decatur was able to achieve when asked how he managed to not only get peace treaties without too much violence, but also get a bunch of money and concessions on top of it. All Decatur said was peace was achieved through the mouth of our cannons, at which point he was given the nickname the conqueror of the Barbary pirates. And with the rest of the world seeing a new country in its infancy stand up for itself against the Barbary pirates and winning, they would start doing it too. And everybody started fighting back and quit paying tribute to the Barbary pirates. And in the coming years, they would fade into nothing as their 300 year reign of terror had come to an end. So in conclusion, the moral of the story W is story. Please, for the love of God, do not mess with America's boats. We won't play no games. We won't play no games. Fatelectrician.com. Quack bang. Out. We straight bullied them, though. And that is part one of the origin story of how America became the world police. Give me a hint. Part two ends after the Korean War when NATO gets founded. <laughs> Another W video by Fat Electrician. Appreciate you for watching. Make sure you hit the thumbs up button. Hit that sub button. Drop a comment. I'm going to see you next time. Have a good one. Peace.